Okay, so this is about ND range kernels and um, more specifically kind of advanced uh, advanced features like using local memory. So there's a bit of duplication here, so I'll, I'll uh, skip through those. So we want to learn about the SQL execution and memory model. We want, want to learn how to enqueue an ND range kernel, uh, uh, ND range kernel functions, and how to use local memory. So again, uh, yeah, the fundamental unit is work items. This is kind of taken from the previous slide, or the previous uh, section. These are organized in work groups, and then work groups are organized in ND ranges. Okay, so again, ND ranges are defined by the global range, not by the number of work groups. Okay, that's quite important. So this ND range has, say, eight, uh, sorry, no, 16 threads in that direction, 16 work items in that direction, two in that direction. So this is a 16 by two um, ND range, and then the local range is just four by one. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, I suppose it would be four by one, yeah. Okay, uh, this is, sorry, this is taken from the previous slide as well. So an ND range can be one, two, or three dimensions. So these individual ranges here uh, can be one, two, or three dimensional. Okay, but you only have two parts. You have the global range and the local range, which is the size of the work group. So these individually could be one, two, or three dimensional. So this is convenient depending on the problem that you're working on. So, uh, this particular, say, work item in this ND range. So there's a global range, which is 12, 12. There's a global ID. So this work item has global ID 6, 5. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This work item has global ID 6, 5. The group range. Okay, so this is the number of groups. Okay, or the, the number of blocks if you're used to dealing in CUDA. So this is 3, 3. The group ID. So what's the ID of this group? So it's 0, 1, and then 0, 1. Okay. Um, the local range, which is the size of the work group, and then the local ID. So the local ID is, is 0. Um, so 0, 1. Uh, sorry, I should be going right and then down. Uh, 0, 1, 2. And then zero one, so it's two one. Okay, this is actually um, yeah. We'll talk more about this in the later slide, but yeah, the way that you index into these ranges is important, uh, and it's actually the opposite of what it is in CUDA, which is uh, yeah important to know. <coughs> so, uh, SQL execution model typically an ND range invocation. Um, in an ND range invocation, SQL will execute the SQL kernel function on a very large number of work items, often in the thousands. So this, uh, this allows us to achieve um, good occupancy, good kind of use of our compute units in, in say, a, a GPU or some other offloading device. Um, yeah, and we execute concurrently. Yes, yeah, so this is, sorry, a bit of duplication from the previous one. Uh, we can, again, synchronize across a work group using a barrier. Okay, so this is especially important if we're dealing with local memory, which we're gonna be detailing um, in a bit. Okay, so again, uh, private memory. Each work item has memory, which is completely private to it. Um, so th this is like a, a register or something. We also have local memory. So a work group shares a local memory. Um, so this work item can uh, write to local memory, which can then be read by another uh, work item. We need to make sure that if that is to happen, that uh, we use a barrier to make sure that something, a write has indeed finished uh, before the read uh, happens. And yet yeah, very important that um, a work group, uh, a work item in a work group cannot access the local memory of another work group. It can only access its own uh, local memory. Okay, and then again, global constant memory. Okay, yeah, so private memory, very, very fast. Local memory is pretty fast, I, I think, um, the, theoretically, between a few cycles and maybe 10 cycles to get to local memory, whereas private memory is theoretically 
maybe one or two cycles uh, that it takes to load this, whereas global and constant memory is within the hundreds of cycles. Uh, so it's a lot slower. So if we can use local memory um, for, say, intermediate computation, we should really, really do this. Um, whereas global uh, memory is, of course, necessary for you know the initial reading in and writing out of values. Uh, and global memory is larger uh, than local memory, and local memory is larger than private memory. Private memory, so this is yet yeah, the kind of speed versus um, size hierarchy. So this is small, very, very fast, um, relatively small, relatively fast, large and slow. Okay, um, so again, we're interested in this time constructing a parallel four with an ND range. Okay, so we're only gonna be dealing with one dimensional ND ranges in this uh, workshop. So an ND range is made up of the global range, okay, which in this case is 1024, and the local range, the size of your work group. So this must divide that, okay? And if you have, say, a two-dimensional, three-dimensional um, range, global range, local range, then each, say, the, the x-coordinate must divide the x-coordinate here, the y-coordinate must divide the y-coordinate here, the z, the z, and so on. Then we can use our ND items uh, to get things like the, the ID number, um, uh, the linear ID. Uh, we can also get things like the, the group the group ID. We can get the, the local ID. We can uh, do a barrier. We can do lots of things with our ND item. OK. Uh, yeah, so on most hardware, global range I must be a multiple of local range I. Okay, so this is not okay. Okay, we won't be able to construct an ND range with this because 64 does not um, uh, divide into 1000. Okay, so this will give us an error. Um, this is okay, this divides. Okay, and you can see that 64 divides into 1024 and 64 uh, is also a factor of 64. Okay, um, yeah, so for NVIDIA hardware, workgroup sizes or uh, block sizes are best chosen from, uh, well, usually not 8 or 16, but usually 32, 64, uh, 128, 256, 512, 10, 24. Okay, so using local memory. So this, um, this is a, a really kind of uh, important thing if you want to uh, write performing code, definitely. Um, so in sickle local memory is called, uh, sorry, sickle local memory is called shared memory in CUDA, as you, uh, we've kind of mentioned already. To use local memory, you must use an accessor. Okay, so we've glossed over the buffer accessor model. Um, but for this, um, for local memory, and also for things like uh, constant memory, texture memory, you need to use accessors. Uh, and the way that we define essentially that it's local memory, is we say we uh, construct an accessor with sickle access target local. So we didn't really have to worry about this q.submit beforehand. So we were just dealing with q.single task, q.parallel4. So when you're trying to, um, when you need to uh, dictate the way memory is managed uh, within your kernel or memory that needs to be used within the kernel, then essentially you need to define this memory, how this is going to relate to outside memory, um, or or not. In this case, uh, this is purely contained within the within the 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 Q dot submit. This uh, local memory can't really go anywhere. Uh, but you need to do this within a submit function. You can't just do it within a, a say a parallel four, uh, because the the memory kind of needs to be set up beforehand, uh, which is similar to say in CUDA. If you have a dynamic um, shared memory size, you need to configure that when you're calling the actual kernel, or you need to, but yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you're constructing an accessor, which just says, essentially, give me a chunk of memory, okay? And you can access this accessor like a pointer. You can access this like a, a just, just a normal pointer. Um, well, because this is one dimensional, if it were, uh, two-dimensional, then you need to do uh, some more things, but yeah, one-dimensional local memory is 
sort of maybe the way to go. Uh, so this is local memory of size, local mem size, and it has type T. Okay, and then this can be used within my kernel. Okay, so yeah, instead of directly enqueuing tasks to the queue, you must submit uh, a command group and use. So this is the, the handler for the command group uh, to which you um, kind of uh, give these memory uh, requirements and you then subsequently submit your parallel for it to the CGH. So this is something that kind of has to, so once you do a queue.submit, uh, every subsequent kind of operation needs to be to the handler for that command group. So this is the command group. So it's a command as well as some memory options. Um, yeah. And this q.submit can only contain um, one command. So a command being a parallel for, a single task, a, a mem copy, and so on. Uh, you can only do this once within, within a q.submit. Uh, so we use a submit when we need to do stuff with memory, but if we don't need to do anything with, with memory with accessors, for instance, then we, it's, it's easier to use the queue.mem copy, queue dot, so on, just because it's less verbose. Um, yeah, so one command within each submit, okay? So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of information in this one slide. Does anyone have any questions about this particular slide? Because there is a lot here. Okay. I'll keep going. Okay. So again, yeah, we're saying the access target is local. And then you can treat accessors like pointers from within kernels. So you use this operator. Okay, so local mem is declared here with a particular size. Okay, and as well, uh, CGH needs to be passed to the function as well, this command group handler. And then once we uh, once we're doing our kernel, then you can just use it as a pointer. Just use it as a normal pointer. That's fine. Okay, so um, now for an ND range. Uh, when you submit a parallel for and you pass in an ND item, okay, you don't need to necessarily pass in an ND item, but it's useful if you do, um, then the ND item has some really useful member functions like get global linear ID. Okay, so this gets your global linear ID as, as if you're indexing into a one dimensional um, array. Uh, your local linear ID, so this is just your within your work group, your linear ID, um, and also the, the group ID. There, there are lots of different things. Um, let's just imagine as well that we're writing to local mem memory uh, with our local ID with some value. And then uh, let's say we want to use this value at some other point, we're going to use i.barrier. So this is a member function of um, the ND item. So this is really important if you're using shared memory. If you're using shared memory, Usually every time you write and you want it to be read somewhere else, you need to make sure that you do a barrier. <coughs> uh, barrier is also a member function of a, of a group, so you can also do that. Okay, questions? We have a question, question in the Slack yeah, there, sorry. Good. Okay, what is the motivation uh, for organizing memory in blocks of local memory? Um, so, we're, we're utilizing the hardware essentially. So each um, block, each work group has access to this region of memory that's quite fast and it can be shared between work items. Uh, so if we can use this, if there are some computations that can be done that utilize this shared memory, essentially we can share, it, this is the only way that we can share data among work items. We cannot share data among work items in separate work groups. Uh, so it's only through this shared memory that we can, you know, have writes and then followed by reads um, from different work items. We're gonna we're gonna see um, a kind of simple example of how we uh, use this to try and to try and optimize things in 
the final the final exercise but yeah essentially the hardware is there so we want to use it uh it's fast and it's if you can use local memory uh your your algorithm whatever it is uh it can be you know orders of magnitude faster than if you're naively using global memory uh if it's suitable not every task necessarily uh needs it, not every task requires shared memory but if it does then you should use it but i'm just for clarification what am i gonna do if i have a distributed memory machine so with some gpus how do i actually handle the memory um do i have to use mpi subroutines to keep uh, transferring the data back and forth and the sql only for accessing the gpus or how do i handle that situation this is a really really good question this is something that gordon is definitely more qualified to answer than than i am if he's still on the line uh, yeah so i'm here so can you repeat the question Yes, so um, if I have a distributed machine, uh, which actually has on uh, local nodes has, let's say some accelerators, GPUs or I don't know, FPGA or something, right? Um, how do I handle the memory between like, the communication? I need to use MPI and then, uh, then just um, uh, transfer the data back and forth between the host uh, memory and the, uh, the device. Do I do that in SQL or is it something that I use external to the program? How do I do exactly that so, in the world? So yeah, so that's a really good question. So it's, SQL is a sort of like single node program model. So you would you generally use something like MPI to communicate between nodes um, and run like a, an instance of SQL with DPC++ on each one. Yeah, generally, generally in the past we've used MPI for multi multi node system. So then, to compile those, I I write my code. Um, essentially, I can write in SQL and just link and also load. I guess the MPI library, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you could have and DPC++ works well with, with MPI, we've, we've done that before. Sorry, sorry, go on, Brian. Oh, yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, we, um, at, at this exact moment, we don't have a, a module for, for MPI built against the SQL compiler. Um, but uh, if, if you're wanting to try that out, I have um, kind of a, a proof of concept, but largely untested build um that should be able to properly use the high-speed network on Perlmutter. Um, so yeah, I, I can I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation over Slack or or um, however um, if you want to take a look at that. And then I can also just comment, I'm aware that there is a, a research project called Celerity, which is um, sort of, I guess, build is, is kind of like a, a sickle for uh, distributed memory platforms. Um, and I mean, that, that's kind of the extent of my knowledge of that, other than it's a, it's a research project and it's kind of outside of the scope of um, what, what we're targeting at the moment. That's great, thank you. Why is it limited to 3D? Um, this is a good question. So this has just got to do with the SQL spec. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the, why it was uh, limited at three dimensions. So so the reason for three dimensions was mainly because it kind of inherited that from OpenCL as SQL was kind of started off as a, uh, an OpenCL kind of high level model, but there is kind of proposals in the works to increase that to, to higher dimensions. I would expect that to be supported in the future. Okay, there you go. Okay, so we're going to. So, um, uh, I had yeah. a thought, Hugh, and uh, like uh, in the yeah. interest of time and kind of getting through the last section, maybe it would make sense we to skip kind of this exercise. Walk, 
or, or kind of walk through the solution and kind of explain, I guess, a bit of that. And then that means you could kind of move on and yeah, yeah. And do the last bit, do you think? <clears throat> that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll fly through this. Okay, so the, the task is essentially to... Um, uh, uh, da, 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 da. The task is to to flip an array. Okay, so you have you have an array. Reverse the direction. Okay, so you could naively um, not gonna write all this out, but you could naively q dot parallel for okay. Okay, so we just do a sickle d range. Okay, and then we do, I don't know, global range. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that this is going to work in any way, but um, <coughs> then we do uh, lambda. Sickle. And then we just see the item. Item the eye. Okay, so the naive way of doing this is okay. Uh, the naive way of doing it. So we're just reversing the 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 vector is um, dev pointer pointer b, and then we would do something like. Um, well, first we need to get some ranges. Oh, this is not nice. Okay. Um, sickle. Uh, so let me do auto. Uh, global ID is equal to I dot get global linear ID. So the, the linear member functions, um, they'll just return a size T. Okay, then we can just say, yeah, let's have dev pointer B, uh, B, um, and then maybe a uh, global range would be where, where we could get, get global range. Okay, and global. Um, global, dim, just so it's different global range. So to I dot. Global uh, if I'm using the correct memory function. Global using the correct memory function. Okay. Anyway, the the idea is uh, you just flip the the array, so we just do uh, So this would, you need to specify this is a one-dimensional ND item. So it'd be uh, global dim minus one minus uh, global index is equal to um, the pointer A. So this is the input, and then that would just be global. IDX. Okay, so the idea is that's the naive way of doing things. Um, but if you use shared memory, so essentially you'll be accessing this in a reversed way. Okay, so each work item will be accessing instead of accessing like in a where work item say n or work item i is accessing point i and work uh, item i plus one is accessing uh, the or indexing into i plus one it's going the opposite way so this is actually probably fine or is it, no it, it definitely is fine by modern um kind of cuda memory managers uh to index into things in a backwards way in a flipped way but um kind of depends on the device if you're working on an older device then it wouldn't necessarily uh, be as optimal. So it would be beneficial to use shared memory as an in-between. So we'll just look at the uh, solution to see. 
uh, x4 solution.cpp. Okay, so instead of just doing it the naive way, we're um, allocating some uh, local memory. We are then uh, loading the local memory uh, with the, the global value. Then we're executing a barrier. And then we're writing back to uh, global memory in a completely aligned way. So we're not flipping it. Uh, and then we're writing back from local memory. So we'll, we'll talk about this more in the upcoming section. But essentially, if you can access global memory in as uh, uniform and contiguous uh, a way as possible, this will give you much better performance. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more. I, I haven't really explained exactly what um, what uh, I mean, but if we try and get work item i and i plus one accessing adjacent points in memory, um, then that will give us better performance. In this case, they actually are ac accessing, sorry, in the naive one, they are accessing adjacent points in memory, but they were flipped. So i plus i and i plus one, work items i and i plus one, were accessing um, elements j and j minus one instead of j plus one. And on older hardware, that would have been a problem. On modern hardware, it's not a problem, but it's kind of a, a very simple use of uh, a of local memory. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? So item dot barrier. This is ensuring that all of the uh, work items in a particular work group, they wait until every work item in that work group has reached this point, and then they proceed to the next step. So in this instance, this is a really, really good question. So in this in instance, um, we're writing to local memory, okay, and then we want to read from local memory. If we didn't have this item dot barrier, because this work item is writing to local IDX and reading from work group size minus local IDX minus one. It's reading from a completely different space. It's reading from uh, something that's been written to by another work item. We need to be able to guarantee that the other work item has finished writing to that space in, uh, in local memory. So the only way that we can do that is by using a, a barrier. So this just synchronizes all of the work items in a work group, but it's only within that work group, not within the, the larger device or anything. We have no way of doing that uh, on the larger device, except for just having one kernel and then finishing the kernel, doing a new kernel. So the, the overhead, um, there is some overhead uh, in that if, if work items have diverged slightly or so on CUDA hardware um, work groups are organized in warps which are groups of 32 um, so warps might be executing at slightly different speeds so it might just so happen that this warp is slightly ahead and it's you know running ahead by a few cycles or whatever and then it needs to wait for this other one to catch up but um, the performance gain uh, of using shared memory is really worth this barrier. It's worth the, you know, having to wait this, say, warp or, um, but also in warps because you have independent forward progress sometimes within work groups, uh, there can be divergent control flows. So you do need to, um, you do need to call wait as well within warps, but um, yeah, the, the overhead is worth it essentially because you're using very, very fast memory. Uh, look at memory of different devices. Um, no, there are not. Uh, the main host memory. Um, so certainly, yeah, not with local memory. Um, yes. Uh, 
Okay. So by, by local memory, if you mean CUDA shared memory, which is uh, requires a synchronization, then you can't share that among work groups um, on the same device, let alone different devices. So I guess you're saying that the barriers keep processes from writing to the same memory. Um, so not necessarily from writing to the same memory. Um, it's just to, you have two things happening asynchronously. So essentially, um, or not asynchronously, but concurrently. So one is going to write, and then essentially you want this one to read as soon as it has been written. This is a way of enforcing that, that there's this event that every um, work item needs to get to before it's allowed to read. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily, it's, it's not about processes. Um, and it, uh, it, we're not thinking about the operating system really here. That's more um, got to do with, uh, yeah, we're, we're not thinking of, of operating systems here. We're just thinking about device code, essentially. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure how operating systems interact with, you know, offload devices in the first place, but um, no, all of this is allocated within the program anyway. Uh, and within a, an individual program, any, like, any work item can write to any any part of memory because it is within the process. It's all one big process. Work items do not represent uh, different processes. Uh, 